So this will be the second lecture over NMR spectroscopy. So last time we were talking about chemical shift. <clears throat> so I'll just uh, continue with talking about chemical shift to explain it in more detail. So um, if we take these two molecules, 2,2-dimethylpropane, and this molecule which is called TMS, so just an acronym for tetramethylsilane. <clears throat> so if we look at the NMR of both of those, and so let's just focus on one of the CH bonds. Of course, all of the hydrogens in, in the molecule, in either molecule is equivalent. So we'll just look at one of the hydrogens as an example. So if you apply an external magnetic field, then again, the electrons in the bonds, CH bonds, will generate, they have their own magnetic field. And when the, <clears throat> you apply it, uh, external magnetic field B, that's gonna cause the electrons uh, magnetic field um, those magnetic field lines will look like this so you have what's called an induced magnetic field and so all magnetic fields close on each other so they're circular like that or it's not really circular because it's three-dimensional uh, but the point is again so the hydrogen is in a region of space where the induced field is in the opposite direction of the applied field so that's going to cancel out some of the induced field and cause the hydrogen to need less energy to do a nuclear spin flip. So if we compare the CH and diethylpropane versus tetramethylsilane, so the magnetic field lines look the same. They're just different in magnitude. <clears throat> so which one is going to be bigger? Uh, the induced field for dimethylpropane or for tetramethylsilane, <clears throat> and the answer is this will be the one that's bigger. So the induced field is bigger for tetramethylsilane, uh, and the reason is because silicon is less electronegative uh, than carbon, <clears throat> so it's going to be electron releasing. So if you have silicon attached to carbon, which is attached to hydrogen, <clears throat> so it comes less electron negative than carbon, so it's going to release the electron density of the carbon, which in turn is going to make this CH bond more electron rich. Uh, compared to here, where you have carbon, carbon, hydrogen. So if there's more electron density in the CH bond, <clears throat> then the induced field from the electrons is going to be bigger. And since it's opposed to be in the region where hydrogen is at, that's gonna subtract some of the field that hydrogen fills. And so you're gonna need less energy to do a nuclear spin flip. <clears throat> and so what that means is the, uh, it'll be, the signal will be more upfilled than it would be otherwise. <clears throat> so this is significant because what is carbon usually attached to? Carbon is usually attached to fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, bromine, for example. Hydrogen, of course, <clears throat> um, in each of these cases, fluorine, oxygen, <clears throat> nitrogen, chlorine, bromine are all more electron negative than carbon. So they all remove electron density from carbon, which in, would in turn remove electron density from the CH bond. Whereas silicon is less electron, uh, electron negative than carbon, so which in turn is gonna increase the electron density in a CH bond. <clears throat> So, um, <clears throat> so this hydrogen basically would, would resonate or spin flip upfield of almost all hydrogens in a molecule. <clears throat> and so this is useful because uh, what's done is basically to take the tetramethylsilane and use it as an internal standard. Whoa. Where you put a little bit of tet tetramethylsilane into your NMR tube, and wherever the signal is for TMS, you call that zero, zero hertz, and then everything is measured with respect to TMS. <clears throat> okay. So the signal for TMS then is placed at zero hertz, <clears throat> and so this can find use, um, so we're now going to define 
define chemical shift rather than hertz, we're going to define it in what's called parts per million or ppm. So if you did this experiment, if you took chloroform and with a 0.03% TM mass would be what's typically used. And if you take this NMR on a 100 megahertz NMR, which has a 2.535 Tesla magnet, <clears throat> then what you would see, well, you would see a signal at zero hertz for the TM mass. And then you'd see a signal at 728 hertz and that's for that hydrogen absorbing radio frequency radiation and doing a nuclear spin flip. <clears throat> so if you did the same experiment on a 200 megahertz NMR, which has a 4.7 Tesla magnet, so then what you would see is a signal at zero. and 1456 hertz which is for the hydrogen of chloroform doing a nuclear spin flip well so basically you see two signals but we tell the computer to put that signal that's upfield which we know is tms at zero and then the computer says okay fine if you put this at zero this is the ch signal is at 1456 hertz so if you notice if we double the magnetic field then we double uh, the frequency needed to cause a nuclear spin flip. And so chemical shift is often reported in um, what's called units, delta units. Uh, so that's the Greek symbol delta. And this is how it's calculated. So you just take the position of the signal in Hertz minus the position of TMS in Hertz and divide it by the spectrometer frequency, which is a megahertz times 10 to the six Hertz per one megahertz. So if we do that for these two signals, so for the 728 on a 100 megahertz instrument and the 1456 on a 200 megahertz instrument. <clears throat> so 728 hertz for CHCO3 and TMS is at zero hertz. And then it's a 100 megahertz in MR. And if we convert that to hertz, about 1,000 hertz. Uh, not 1,000, that would be kilo. 10 to the 6, sorry. It's 10 to the 6 hertz mega per 1 megahertz. And then that would give you this number 0 0.00000728. So it's a unitless number because megahertz and hertz cancels out. Or 7.28 ppm. And ppm stands for parts per million. Right, what is a million? A million is 10 to the 6. So if we took that number times 10 to the 6, then we get 7.28 ppm. <clears throat> so it would be more common to s to report this in a 7.28 ppm uh, rather than hertz, 728 hertz. So if we did the thing, same thing for this signal on the 200 megahertz and more, so 1456 hertz for the signal minus zero hertz for TMS divided by 200 megahertz and more times 10 to the six hertz per one megahertz, then you get 7.28 ppm. <clears throat> so the basic point is, so when you report chemical shift in ppm, then it's not necessary to, to state the instrument magnet strength, whether it's a 100 hertz, megahertz or 200 megahertz or a 500 megahertz or more, for example, <clears throat> because uh, if it's reported in ppm, then it doesn't matter what the instrument is, the chemical shift is the same. So if you had a peak at 6.2 ppm, for example, on a 100 megahertz NMR, it would be at 6.2 ppm on a 500 megahertz NMR as well. Okay, so sometimes it's useful to go backwards and to convert from ppm back to hertz. So if you had a signal at 5.28 ppm on a 200 megahertz NMR, for example, <clears throat> then what is the frequency where this signal is found? So the conversion is easy. Just take the ppm times the megahertz of the instrument. 
so that signal would be at 1050 hertz. <clears throat> so this will be a useful calculation to do converting ppm back to hertz um, when we talk about coupling constants later on. Okay, so factors that affect chemical shift. So we've looked at so far electronegative atoms. <clears throat> so the closer a hydrogen is on a carbon, the closer that is to an electronegative atom, the further that signal is going to be downfilled at a higher ppm. <clears throat> so in essence, then the hydrogen fills more of the magnet, the external magnet, uh, since there is less electron density in the CH bond to induce a magnetic field that opposes the applied field. <clears throat> Okay, so there's a second main effect that uh, that affects chemical shift, and that is pi systems. So basically anything with the carbon-carbon double bond, carbon-carbon triple bond. So if we took these two molecules, cyclohexane and benzene, for example, to compare, and we look at the hydrogen, where is the hydrogen, what is its chemical shift? Okay, so if you put these in an external magnet, then the CH electrons will, you'll have an induced magnet. Um, you have an induced field from the electrons. And so for cyclohexane, that signal is at about one PPM. <clears throat> so if, if it was only these electrons affecting the chemical shift of the hydrogen for benzene, then the chemical shift would be similar. Not quite the same, but there is something else going on in benzene. And what's going on in benzene is you have three double bonds, right? And each of those has an electron in it. So for those of you who haven't had organic two yet, you haven't talked about aromaticity yet, uh, but these electrons are free to move. Right, we could draw this resonance structure. <clears throat> so sometimes you see benzene represented like that. Um, so those that would represent this concept of aromaticity that these electrons are free to move in that pi system. <clears throat> and that has what's known as gives you a ring current and that ring current. So you basically you have six electrons moving in that ring and those six electrons will have their own magnetic fields. <clears throat> and so the magnetic field lines for the benzene um, looks like this. Oops. Well, okay, one second, let's erase that. So we have two magnetic field lines here. One just from the CH electrons, which look like that. Uh, but that is small compared to, let's put these in red. But that is small compared to the ring, to the magnetic field from these moving electrons. And what that, those magnetic field lines look like is this. And this is much bigger. And so if you notice here, Hydrogen lies in a region of space. Where the ring current So the ring current, uh, so the electrons moving in the ring their magnetic field is in the same direction as, so notice that arrow is pointing up and that arrow is pointing up, that meaning they're in the same direction. So what in this essence that is going to do is going to, it's going to deshield the hydrogen, basically meaning it's going to fill more of the magnet. And so if it fills more of the magnet, it's going to require more energy to do a nuclear spin flow. So it's going to be downfilled in the NMR at a higher chemical shift. So what you find, so even though both of these hydrogens are on carbon, hydrogens on benzene are around 7.2 ppm compared to that hydrogen on carbon, which is just around 1 ppm because cyclohexane doesn't have the ring current. <clears throat> so you see similar effect with alkenes. So if you, so you have two 
electrons in the pi system here, right? <clears throat> and those electrons are free to move in that pi system. And so they will have their own um, magnetic field. And when you place an alkene in the presence of an external magnetic field, what those magnetic field lines look like is that. And so this, if you notice, same direction, right? So hydrogen is now going to um, be deshielded or it's going to fill more of the magnetic field B. And so that's going to require more energy to do a spin flip. So hydrogen's on alkene, you typically fly between 5 and 7 ppm. And so for an alkyne, of course, you have two pi bonds, so you have six, uh, four electrons in a pi system there. And if you put that in the external magnetic field, what those magnetic field lines look like is that. And so if you notice now, these are in opposite directions. So in the region of space where hydrogen is at, the magnetic field lines for the pi system is in opposite direction of the applied field. And so that's going to shield the hydrogens from the magnet, meaning it's going to require less energy for them to do a nuclear spin flip, so they will be upfilled in the NMR at a lower ppm. So hydrogens on an alkyne you typically find at around 2 ppm in chemical shift. <clears throat> okay, so one more example of a pi system. So this is a molecule that we work in with in my research lab all the time. It's what's known as a porphyrin. Uh, so you find porphyrins in chlorophyll, you find porphyrins in hemoglobin. Uh, so the four nitrogens combine metals like iron and hemoglobin. Okay, so if you, and if you notice there's lots of double bonds, so there's lots of pi electrons. <clears throat> and it's a huge, huge surface. And so if you put this in an external magnetic field, then from the electrons in the double bonds, what their magnetic field lines will look like is... is that. So it's a big ring current. All right, so, so from all of those carbon-carbon double bond electrons, this is another example of an aromatic molecule and their magnetic field lines look like this. <clears throat> and so if you notice here, the hydrogens on the perimeter of the ring are in a region of space where the induced field and applied field are in the same direction as the, the induced field's in the same direction as the applied field, meaning it's gonna require more energy for these to do a spin flip. So for hydrogens on the perimeter of a porphyrin, uh, you typically find these hydrogens around 8 ppm and NMR. <clears throat> and these hydrogens on nitrogen, so even though they're on nitrogen, which is electronegative, and that would typically send peaks downfield to higher ppm, what's more important is the, if you notice the induced field is in the opposite direction of the applied field. So what's, what is that going to do? That's going to shield the hydrogens, and that means it's going to send them upfield. So most hydrogens in, air, in organic molecules are downfield of zero ppm. Most are downfield of one ppm, and especially if they're attached to an electronegative atom like oxygen or nitrogen. But in this case, because of the ring current and where those hydrogens lie in space in a region of space where the induced field is opposed to the applied field, those are actually quite far upfield. You find these hydrogens at negative three to negative four ppm. So you find them at negative uh, ppm. And again, purely because of that pi system and green current. Okay, so some characteristic regions in the NMR. So if you see a signal between 10 and 12, so if you see a signal here, then that is typically the hydrogen on a carboxylic acid. 
So if you notice, it's got both. It's got a pi system that's going to send signal downfield, and it's attached to electromagnetic atom oxygen. Uh, nine to eleven. If you see a signal there, that would typically be the hydrogen on an aldehyde. And seven to eight ppm would typically be hydrogens on an aromatic ring like benzene. Uh, five to seven ppm is hydrogens on an alkene. Uh, we mentioned hydrogens on an alkyne, or around two ppm. So are hydrogens on a carbon next to a carbon-carbon double bond. They're around 2 ppm. And so that's really about the only characteristic regions in NMR. Most of the other signals are going to be between, uh, between 1 and 5 ppm, and that's a lot, right? <clears throat> so the 1 and 5 ppm region is typically pretty cluttered. 5 to 12 ppm, not so much. Uh, but the point is... You know, if you see a peak at 11 ppm in proton NMR, pretty good shot you've got a carboxylic acid, right? You see a signal at 9 ppm in NMR, pretty obvious that you probably have an aldehyde. <clears throat> so you should just memorize these general regions, um, especially for those of you who want to go on to medical school or dental school or pharmacy school and you want to take an MCAT, uh, DAT, or a PCAT entrance exam, you would just be expected to know this information. In this class, you'll have correlation tables where you can look up this information. So, for example, so you have what are known as alpha table, beta table, and an aromatic or benzene table. So let's go through how, how you read that. So if we took this molecule, for example. <clears throat> so if we wanted to look up the chemical shift of that CH2, so we call that M. And so M is directly attached to chlorine, so it's in the alpha position. So this would be alpha, beta, for example, with respect to the chlorine. So we would look up MCL in the alpha table. And then this is your key. If it's a CH, then it's closed dots. If it's a CH2, open dots. And if it's a CH3, it's a bar. So this is a CH2, so we want to look up the open dots. So basically we would look up that and we would see 3.4. So this CH2 would be at about 3.4 ppm and NMR. <clears throat> if we wanted to look up this, then we would call that M. And M is attached to oxygen, which is attached to C double one O, which is attached to some alkyl group R. <clears throat> so that's what you would look up in the table, M-O-C-O-R. And again, it's a CH2, so we would look up the open dots. So that would be at about 4.2 ppm. And if we wanted to look up the CH3, then M, and then we go that way to the left. So M is attached to CO, which is attached to O, and then R. So we would be looking up this, right? M is attached to C double bond O, which then is attached to oxygen and then some alkyl group. And so now it's a CH3, so we would be looking up the bar. So we look up the bar and we see that it's about 2 ppm. So that would be at about 2.0 ppm. Okay, so what if you wanted to look up that? <clears throat> well, so with respect to this chlorine, it's alpha, beta with respect to the chlorine, or it's alpha, beta with respect to the ester. <clears throat> So on the beta table, um, sorry, this would be, this is wrong. This would be M CH, uh, well, it would just be M carbon and then a chlorine. <clears throat> and same is true here. And same, let's see. So you would see M and then a carbon, and then an oxygen, and then a CO, and then the R group. <clears throat> okay, so with three, so this is a CH2, so we look up the open dots. So the chlorine would want to put this at about 3.4. No, 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 I think I must have forgot to change this. Yes, I wrote these out, but I forgot to change them. And unfortunately, my notes are downstairs. 
so this is not right. But I can tell you that this would be about one, around one PPM, one about 1.5 PPM. <clears throat> Same here. Okay. So, but anyway, if you, if if your group that you're looking up is not directly attached to, to something, if it's just attached to a carbon, but the next position has an electronegative group, then you would be looking up the beta table. So M C O C W one O R was what you would look up going this way, or going this way. M C C L is what you would look up and see where the chemical shift of that is at. <clears throat> Okay, what if you have a benzene ring? Um, so where are these hydrogens at? Um, so in order to un interpret the beta ring table, again, you would need to have organic two first. Some of you don't. So you, you need to understand this nomenclature. So if we have something attached to benzene, so this would be carbon one. So that's carbon two or that's carbon two. That's called the ortho position, O or ortho. That's carbon three or that's carbon three, depending on whether you go clockwise or counterclockwise around the ring. But these two positions are equivalent. That's called the meta position. Or carbon four opposite of the group is what's called the para position. <clears throat> okay, so if we wanted to look up these hydrogens, we would look at O or P. And so what we see here, so the first, um, thing listed is for the metal hydrogens and since these are in parentheses the ortho and para just happen to be at the same chemical shift so we have 7.4 for the metal hydrogens so those would be at 7.4 and they're equivalent so that it would be one signal at 7.4 and then the ortho and the para hydrogens would be at 7.0 Okay, so if we did the same thing here, so this is what's called, so this is an NO2 group called nitro. So the ortho hydrogens, so we have ortho and then para and the meta, so the ortho would be at about 8.2 ppm, and then we have the para would be at about 7.7, .7, so that hydrogen would be at about 7.7, .7. and then we have the meta, which would be at about 7.4, so these two hydrogens are equivalent. They would be at about 7.4. Okay, so if this was your substituent, the NH2, the amine, uh, then these ortho hydrogens, um, so this is MPO, so this would be ortho, so they're only at about 6.4. <clears throat> so they're a little bit out of that 7 to 8 window where most aromatic hydrogens are at. And then para is at about 6.8. And then the meta is about 7.2. Okay, so let's take a little bit of time and explain why are they different in chemical shift. In each case, they're just attached a carbon. So why are they different in chemical shift? And you can explain that using resonance structure. So if we took this molecule and drew resonance, you can move those two electrons down and make a double bond there and these two electrons you can make a lone pair on that carbon which will give you this resonance structure <clears throat> and if you notice this is an ortho position with a negative charge it means it has high electron density so what's high electron density going to do it's going to have a I mean there's for that ch bond there's going to be high electron density in that bond which means the induced field is going to be larger <clears throat> right and for the ch bond the induced field is is opposed to the applied field so that increased electron density is going to shield that hydrogen and it's going to send it up field which is why you see it at 6.4 ppm <clears throat> so if we keep drawing resonance structures so we could take the lone pair and move it there and then move the next pi bond up onto the paracarbon to make a lone pair so you can see the paracarbon is shielded since it has high electron density.
And if you noticed it, it skipped the meta position, the negative charge did, the lone pair did. So we draw another resonance structure. We can move that lone pair there and then move the next pi bond up to put the lone pair here. So another ortho position. So you notice again, it skipped the meta position. So that negative charge can never be at the meta position. So the ortho and the pair positions have increased electron density. So they're gonna be shielded. They're gonna be upfilled. And the meta one is gonna be more downfilled because that negative charge can never be at the meta position. So it can never shield uh, the CH hydrogen. Okay, um, so let's sketch the NMR of this molecule. This is our solvent system, deuterated chloroform spiked with 0.03% TMS. So first of all, why do we use deuterated chloroform? Why not? Why not CHCl3? And it's because uh, we're doing proton NMR. So any hydrogen will have a signal. So if we use that as our solvent, so furthermore, when you do NMR, so if we have an NMR tube, we typically have about 0.75 mils of solvent. And we have about that much sample, just enough to cover the bottom of an NMR tube. So very little sample is required for NMR. So if this was, if this was CHCl3, then your solvent peak would be huge and your, com and your compound peak would be tiny. It may be so small it's just lost in the noise in the baseline. So that would be why we use deuterated solvents. If you remember what deuterium is, deuterium is just an isotope of hydrogen. And so in this region that we're scanning, deuterium is not gonna absorb, uh, it's not gonna do nuclear spin flips, so there would be no signal for the deuterium. So if this was uh, CdCl3, 99.8%, uh, then what you would see is your, you still have, that means there's 0.2% ChCl3. So you would see a tiny signal for the 0.2% ChCl3 and then your compound signal would be large so that you can see it. So all of the NMRs are done with deuterated solvents rather than the uh, hydrogen based solvents. That, that suppresses then the solvent signal. Okay, so let's sketch what the NMR of that would look like. Uh, sorry, whoa, 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 let's undo that. So if we sketch the NMR of this um, molecule, so first of all, so we have two methyls, but they're not the same, right? So let's call this A, and let's call this B. So which one's going to be farther down filled? And that's going to be the one that's attached to oxygen because oxygen is electronegative. And so next to an oxygen of an ester, we'll get you at about 4 ppm. And next to a C double bond, it will get you at about 2 ppm. So your NMR would look like... Would look like that. So this would be the CH3 that's next to C double bond O. And this would be the... CH3 that's attached to oxygen. So in the spectral, spectrons that you would have to work, I've asked you to assign the signal, so that's what I mean. Tell me what each signal belongs to in the molecule. And then this would be the 0.2% CHCl3 in your solvent, and this would be the TMS, right? So if you notice, um, so one thing that you can do in NMR is you can tell the NMR 
to measure the area under these peaks. If you do that, you're doing what's called integration. So integrate the area under those peaks. And what the computer would tell you is that these areas, so let's see, what do we call this? We call, we call this B and this A methyl group. So the computer would tell you that A to B is in a one to one ratio or a two to two ratio or a three to three ratio or a four to four ratio. It, it just knows it's a one to one ratio. Uh, but you could tell the computer, if you know what the molecule is, tell the computer this molecule has six hydrogens, then they would tell you that these areas are three to three. It's in a three to three ratio. <clears throat> okay, so let's sketch the NMR of this molecule. In 99.8% deuterated chloroform with 0.03% TMS. So first of all, how many different signals would there be? How many different hydrogens are there? Well, these two are equivalent, right? So that would be one signal. And then the four hydrogens on benzene are all equivalent because there's a plane of symmetry there. So these are the same. And there's a plane of symmetry here. So these are the same. So there's only two signals again. <coughs> Where would they be? Well, these hydrogens, so first of all, you would see your 0.2% chloroform, or CHCl3. And then hydrogens on benzene are between seven and eight, so these would be at about 7.2. And then the methyl groups would be around two also. And then your TMS. Uh, but let's draw this better, more representative of what it would look like. Okay, um, so let's call this the methyl groups A and the aromatic hydrogens B. So we could, uh, we could assign the signals like that to put a code on your molecule and then put the code on the spectra to tell me what goes to what. Uh, so question for you is why did I draw A bigger than B? And the reason why is because A has six hydrogens giving rise to it because it's two methyl groups and B has four hydrogens giving rise to it. So if you measure the area under the curve, so that's what you do is you tell the computer to cut this peak here, cut the peak there, cut the peak here, cut the peak there, measure the area under it. The software does this for you. If you tell the computer, the software, molecule has 10 hydrogens, then the computer tells you that this is six and that this is four, right? So that's what integration is. Integration is the area under a signal, which represents the relative ratio of hydrogens in the molecule giving rise to the signal. There. So the computer doesn't know that this is six and four unless you tell that there's 10 hydrogens total. The computer just knows that this is in the three to two ratio. So the computer could tell you three to two, or it could tell you six to four, or it could tell you nine to six, it, but it always had that ratio. <clears throat> and then this is information as well, right? So if you saw this in MR and you saw, and you knew that these were aromatic hydrogens, and you see that it integrates to four, well, you know these hydrogens are on benzene, right? Well, how many hydrogens does benzene have? Benzene has six hydrogens, but this is four. So the benzene is doubly substituted. Right, that means there's two things on benzene because it's missing two hydrogens. And so at this point, you wouldn't know if your benzene is substituted like that, one, two, or like that, one, three, or like that, one, four. But as we cover more information in the MR, then you'll be able to figure it out, whether it's 1, 2, 1, 3, or 1, 4, disubstituted. But the point is, integration gives you information about the molecule. You know, you see this number 6 integrates to 6. Well, what is that? Could that be a CH6? No, you can't put six hydrogens on carbon, right? So you see 6, that would tell you there's probably two equivalent CH3. Or it could mean that there's three equivalent 
CH2 is in the molecule, right? But you need to have six hydrogens that are the same in order for there to be one signal that integrates to six hydrogens. Okay, so if we sketch the NMR of this molecule, so there's so this methyl is not the same as this methyl, right? So that we'll call that A, B, and C. A and C are not the same. Uh, they're both CH3s, but one is attached to a C double bond O and one is attached to a CH2, so they're different, so they're going to give different signals. So three signals plus the solvent signals, so one for that and one from that, so five signals total. Which one will be farthest downfield? That's going to be B, because it's attached to oxygen. So you would have a signal for chloroform, signal for B. Um, a would be at about 2, and C would be at about 1, and plus your TMS. <coughs> so three signals plus two from the solvent system. But in reality, that's not what your signals would look like. <coughs> what your signals would really look like would be this. And this is, has what's known as splitting pattern. So this is what's known as a quartet. <clears throat> this is a singlet. It's one single peak and this is a triplet uh, because it's three peaks. <clears throat> and so that's what we're going to talk about in the next lecture. So we've talked about chemical shift. Hopefully that makes sense. We've talked about integration. Hopefully that makes sense now. So if you integrated the area under these curves, so tell your computer software to cut that there, cut that there, and cut that there, and measure the areas. <clears throat> and it'll tell you that this is in a three to three to two ratio uh, because there's, um, where did it go? C, there's three hydrogens giving rise to C. And there's two hydrogens giving rise to B. And there's three hydrogens giving rise to A, so it's going to integrate in the three to two, three to three to two ratio. <coughs> and then in the next lecture, we talk about splitting pattern. Where do these quartets, singlets, doublets come from? Okay, so last point here. So just some common solvents in NMR. We've talked about deuterated chloroform. You can also find deuterated acetone commonly used. So all of the hydrogens in Acetone replaced with deuterium or DMSO. Hydrogens replaced with deuterium or methanol. Right, again, hydrogens replaced. So these, so deuterated water, deuterated methanol for the more polar molecules. If you need a polar solvent to dissolve them uh, for the nonpolar molecules. And then DMSO pretty much dissolves, pretty pretty well dissolves almost all organic molecules. Uh, so it's a very useful solvent in that regard. The downsize is that it's a very hard solvent to remove. So if you want to recover your sample at the end, DMSO is hard to get rid of. Very high boiling point and your molecules just tend to st stay dissolved in it. It's possible to get rid of it, it's just not easy. And the other downside to it is that it absorbs through your skin and carries whatever is dissolved <clears throat> with it, through your skin with it. <clears throat> so that could be useful if it's a medicine that you want to absorb through your skin, but not so useful if it's uh, some toxic compound that you're doing an NMR on and you don't want to get it on you because it would absorb through your skin. And then another downside is that after it's absorbed through your skin, eventually you taste it in your mouth and smell it on your breath and it's got sulfur in it, so it's not the most pleasant smell or taste. Okay, but anyway, just keep in mind that most of your NMR, well, your NMR solvents are going to be deuterated with a small fraction of the undeuterated solvent in there, which can be useful uh, because the 0.2% CHCl3 has a peak at 7.2, which you can, 7.28, which you can also use as a reference point. Same for all of the other solvents. Okay, we'll stop there.